So I wanted to look at a, well, it's a story. It's a story, but um, a particular verse in this story. And it's in Matthew chapter 27. And it's, uh, it's an interesting chapter because this chapter helps us understand how different individuals deal with this feeling of, um, or sense of responsibility of having their hands tainted with blood, innocent blood in particular. And, you know, there's a lot that can be unpacked there and a lot that be, can be looked at there, especially if we can think about it from the perspective of being in the West. And, you know, in the West, we hear these stories about um, child slavery and, um, you know, how much of our clothes are produced in, in in these terrible facilities and you know we have a sense of um we have a sense of guilt of blood guilt that we are somehow responsible for the innocent blood of some of these individuals and so there is a lot to unpack in matthew chapter 27 i believe it gives us four portraits of how people deal with innocent blood but in particular i wanted to look at a verse because i think you know when the story is talked about it's often, very often, underlooked. And it's the story, it's, it's a verse just before the, the Judas um, taking his own life part. And I just want to take a look at that and examine it for a little bit. So it's Matthew chapter 27, verse 4. And it says, and there's a couple different translations. But I really like how the uh, New Living Translation puts it. So Judas is, comes back to the high priests and, and those who have given him, who gave him money to betray the Christ. And he, he throws them back the, the, the pieces of silver. And he says, I have sinned, he declared, for I have betrayed an innocent man. Now, the New Living Translation does a good job of putting this together, but I think the one thing that it unfortunately takes away is when it says innocent man, the word there is blood, and it would be better stated as blood, especially if you're trying to follow the, the thematic structure that starts all the way from Cain with this theme of innocent blood. But nevertheless, he says, I have sinned, he declared, for I have betrayed an innocent man, innocent blood. And they said to him, what do we care? They retorted, that's your problem. And Ivy says, what is that to us? They replied, that's your responsibility. King James says, and they said, what is it that to us? See thou to that. And so we don't often talk about this because, you know, what happens right after that situation is that Judas takes his life. And so, you know, many of us usually focus in on the fact that he took his own life and um, that he did so with clearly this, this feeling of tremendous guilt that he betrayed innocent blood. Of course, I, I, would, I would think that most Christians would, would realize that at the same time, you know, he didn't have to... He didn't have to go down that that way. In fact, the guilt of him, the guilt upon him was tremendous because he thought that there is nothing, just like Macbeth, uh, that there was nothing that could be done to remove the stain uh, from of blood from his hands and her hands. And so, the the only thing that seems plausible is to remove yourself from existence. But there's a good question to be asked and I don't know necessarily the answer to this question, but I, I think that there are things in these stories for us to pick up on and see how would we react differently. Now, these were the religious leaders of the society at the time. And uh, these were seen as the most important figures, uh, the people that you went to with your biggest questions. And so you can imagine, when Judas comes to them with this feeling of guilt over what he had done, I mean, he, he didn't have to go to them. He didn't have to go to them. He could have 
gone from there and taken his life in, in such same manner, if that's what he intends to do. But I think it's interesting that he comes to them and he, you know, he throws the coins at them. And they and he says they have I have sinned and betrayed innocent blood. This is a confession. You know, some people say that uh, therapists or psychologists, counselors are kind of um, modern day or, or secular priests, if you will, because the process of going to through the therapeutic process is almost in a in a way a sense of a confessional, right? It's a, it's a confession of to what has been done to you, what you have been doing, what you have been thinking. And so it's, it's a confessional process. And you can imagine that at this time, the priests are seen as the ones that would have the most care, a level of sympathy uh, and understanding and provide right answers. But and so I think, so I think Judas was looking for some sort of direction, some sort of some sort of, um, if you will, understanding and, and guidance as to what he should do based on what has happened. And so there's a confessional process. I have betrayed innocent blood. It's like, what do I do? And I think a lot of the times the statements that we make are, are meant, especially when we we're sharing them with others are, in not always, but in some cases, um, are are more of questions. I did this, and you're hoping to, and you're hoping to get some sort of feedback sometimes as to what should come next after you've done this. Not only some feedback, also some some empathy and some grace and some understanding. But the response of the ones in charge is that's your problem. There's a, um, it's a lot of commentary on this. And um, Eli, um, I think it's Ellicott's commentary for English readers. And there are many. It says, we instinctively feel as we read these words, that deep as was the guilt of Judas, that of those who thus mocked him was deeper still. And that's kind of the idea that, um, and somehow we're kind of all complicit in, to some sort of degree, into some of the results of things that we see take place in society, you know, um, and, and, to, and, to, and to some degree we are, and to some degree we should take that responsibility or a certain level of responsibility. And so I like that this is the, I like this commentary. Speaking after the manner of men, we may say that a word of sympathy and true counsel might have saved him even then. His confession was a, ge a germ of repentance, but this repulse drove him back upon despair, that he had not the courage or faith to turn to the great, and here it's basically talking about Jesus, the Christ, the absolver, and so life has closed as in blackness of darkness. And if we ask the question, is there any hope, we dare not answer. Possibly there mingled with his agony, as has been suggested by at least one of the great teachers of the church, some confused thought that in the world of the dead, behind the veil, he might meet his Lord and confess his guilt to him. And so the idea is that perhaps, you know, Judas may have the opportunity someday. But what I, what I, really, what I really think that we should ponder upon is how we react to people when they share with us some of the the level of perhaps atrocity. Um, we might hear some of the worst things possibly said from people. And I know in, in some of the work that I do, I often hear terrible things that people have done. But we have an opportunity. You know, we can say that's your problem or what is it to us and what that does is that it can push this individual further into the darkness into the despair into the hopelessness so the thing that we must ask ourselves is when people are sharing such 
vulnerable information, such difficult information, what is our reply? Is it that is your problem? And that could be that could be said in various different ways, you know, our our apathy towards the situation, the way that we react or our 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 facial expressions or lack of commentary, right? Many of these things can signal how we feel about what has just taken place. And I think this is here for us to really ponder about what it really means to be the kind of person that invites people that have experienced um, or not just experienced, but have also perpetrated um, various levels of things that we, we would call um, malevolent unto themselves or to other people and how we have an opportunity just like they did, but they did not to realize that, you know, we all share some sort of level of responsibility into some of these problems, whether that's us or family members of the individual or coworkers, whatever that may be. And asking ourselves, how can we be part of pointing people to a redemptive process rather than pushing them back into isolation? And I think that's something that we can pick up from the story of Judas.